one thing I teach students, I teach adults, is that you have to protect your body and your mind. The reality in order for you to be able to be successful in this world, you must know who you are and take care of your mental faculties. Um, I will share my story for a later time, being that we are short on time right now, but I want you guys to understand the importance of a word that is called time prosperity. So whenever I'm speaking, I've always tell my audience members to make sure that you have something to write with, because I don't want you to lose sight of the message that's being taught to you. I seldom take the time out to have prescribed PowerPoints. Uh, one of the reasons is I don't like to read from PowerPoints because I have a condition called dyslexia. And autism is, can be very tricky at times because people already want to stereotype you and make it out to be something more than what it really is. It just means that my brain functions differently and I learn differently. And so I've learned a way to perfect learning and then I start utilizing to teach other people. So the first word I want you to write down is time prosperity. Okay, time prosperity. And time prosperity is simply have enough time, having time to do the things that you need to do without being stressed is having the time, having the time to do the things you need to do, to do things, I'll just brief shortly, do things that you need to do without feeling stressed. Okay, that you need to do, my handwriting get better in a second. without feeling stress. Okay, now, what does that mean? That means that oftentimes we make excuses. And we have these excuses about why you didn't get something completed um, when you know ahead of time what is necessary for you to complete the assignments. And what I'm gonna do today is one of our first lessons is to teach you how to activate time prosperity. I don't like time management because time is gonna go on without us. And it's kind of hard to grab it by its rings and pull it back. But you can pre-plan to get things done. And planning is very, very important if you're looking to prosper. So one of the key words that I want both of you gentlemen to write down is going to be the word practice. After today, you will never look at practice the same. So practice is simply P-R-A-C-T-I-C-E. I want you to understand in the middle of the word practice is the word ACT, which if you read the word out loud, it says act. And so the next thing I want you to do is write down the word act, which is an action, which is simply means to do. Anytime that you're practicing or preparing for something, you must put the practice in and the practice is only activated when you start doing what's necessary. The action that you're performing is preparing yourself for a career in the world of academia, and it takes practice. The reality is, once you activate the act, you're left with a word, and the word is price. You must ask yourself, what price, what price am I willing to pay to be the most extraordinary teacher on this globe. You just don't want to be a anybody teacher. You want to be that teacher that all your students remember because you have changed the part of the brain, which is called the hippocampus. And then they can recall the things that you taught them for the rest of their lives. But in order for you to be able to do that, you have to be willing to take the time out to practice. You have to pay that price. I like to think that the P and the R deals with public relations. So write that down. How do you relate back to the public when you begin to teach or when someone is sitting back learning from you? What is that relationship that you have with the public? When someone says, I wanna take Mr. Moore's class because he's an extraordinary teacher versus I wanna take Mr. Moore's class because he's never there. 
See, when you practice and you're doing what's right, you want the best of everything. So your relationship publicly will mean a lot when it comes down to teaching and when it comes down to you being very effective. And so I challenge all students to take the time out and practice. If you notice at the end of the word practice, you have the word ice, which is simply water. And I'm always trying to make sure you guys are hydrated. So I tell my students, hey, man, drink as plenty of water, much as water as you can. I do about a gallon and a half a day. So water, or better yet, ice, is broken down into three forms. You have a solid, a liquid, and a gas. The reality is the world can be a very cold place if you are not doing the things that you're supposed to be doing. And the world can be very cold to you if you're sitting for this GK exam more than two or three times, you start to lose your sense of confidence. But I promise you on everything I own, if you are able to practice, and if you're able to relate to the public or your public relations is on key, then the physical act of doing something will pay for itself. When I first started building my company, my brand, it was centered on helping fight poverty. And I felt that if I can get more college students or young high school kids to do really well on the ACT and SAT, and if they was able to earn scholarships through their practice, when they leave off of campus, they'll be debt free. To be debt free requires work, but it also requires that practice. And I say to you, young people, what price are you willing to pay to be great? And so that's my just little three minute spill on the word practice. Now let's get to work. The thing that I've noticed across the globe, even my kids in China, um, is the fact that you guys have been misled or taught incorrectly on how to make simple flashcards. That part. The reality is whenever you are making a flashcard, you always have the front and you have a back of your flashcard. But you guys have gotten in the habit of going to Quizlet, which it has great resources. But if you want to get those fine motor skills, which in this profession we call VARC, which is visual, auditory, read, write, and kinesthetics, it all it behooves you to take time out to make your own cards. So a simple three by five index cards can yield a great return on your investment. One of the things that happens a lot when sitting for an exam is looking at what we call commonly misused words. So I'm gonna show you two words that's commonly misused, but I'm gonna also teach you the correct way of making your flashcards. And it's kind of, you know, you probably said it's kind of boring, but let me show you this. You have the front of your card, and then you have the back. So we're gonna take the word accent, okay? The word accent, you will most definitely see on your test. And then the word they use to trick us with, or trick many minorities with, is the word ascent. It can be smelled wrong, or just the fact that you don't know what it means. So now you have two words that seems to sound the same, but have two distinct differences, when it comes down to the proper usage. So on the front side, you will always write the word itself, and then we're gonna get into the parts of speech that you need to know to pass this exam. So accent is a verb. The word ascent happens to be a noun. So the first thing you'll do, you'll write your word down with the part of speech, and then you will begin to write your definition on the same side of your index card. So an accent means to stress, to stress, or to emphasize. I'm an island boy, but you will never be able to hear my accent. So my family is from by way of Trinidad. But I recognize that in this situation, in academics, I don't want people to know my origin because I want to make sure that I have the correct verbal accents. I want to make sure that you're understanding the articulation 
of my words, my sounds, my syllables. When you're teaching to people, you want to take the standard English language and try to incorporate it correctly. And you want to be able to enunciate your sounds and syllables. So when we look at this accent means to stress or emphasize, the best way to retain the information is on the back side of the card, use the word in a sentence immediately. And then throughout the day, when you're communicating with your friends and family members, you want to turn around it and use it as much as possible. So if I say you must accent the last syllable. Now that anytime I see the word accent, I immediately know what the word mean because the know the meaning of words is the ability to utilize them correctly in a sentence structure. Then we take the word ascent, which I told you is a noun. An ascent means a climb, a climb, or a rise. A climb or a rise. So again, I have the word, the part of speech, and then right here, we have the definition. On the back side of the card, I will say, um, let's go with Antonio. So I'll say Antonio ascent Antonio's with a uh, with the apostrophe s ascent a s c e n t of the mountain was dangerous. Okay. Now, whenever you utilize words or vocabulary terms, I put accent here. I want to put ascent in the upper right-hand corner also. So when I flip the card over, I should be able to use the word in a sentence. If you cannot use the word in a sentence, that means you don't know what the word means. And so you need to go back and keep re Because if they utilize it in a paragraph, you will lose the whole meaning if you don't know what the word means. Anytime that you're in college or anywhere and you see a word that you don't know, jot it down on a piece of paper, go home, and then start to build what I call your Rolodex of words. I often share with people that everybody have at least one shoebox in the house. So what you wanna do is to be organized enough that you take these flashcards and place them in a shoebox somewhere that you can always go back to. Periodically, as we do this, what we call spiral learning, which you will learn in your coursework, what will happen is if you go back after a week or two with all these words and keep reviewing them, the part of the brain and that hippocampus would allow you to retain the information. And our ultimate goal is all about retention. So in our brains, we have these things called neurons and we have dendrites. And when they're firing on the right cylinders, it becomes, it begins to mesh. The part of the brain stores that good information. And so at any given time, you can recall the information and you can utilize it effectively. The one thing that they're doing in Singapore and Finland with the kids that I work with is that every kid know this secret. And it's the secret, guys, so write this down. Every time you learn something new, you change your brain. Once again, every time you learn something new, you change your brain. Your objective while you're being charged for an education is to learn as much as you can positively so that you don't forget it. So in other words, if you guys were to see me out in a little while over at Walmart or Target, about 15 minutes ago, you didn't know who I was. Now I've changed your brain, and now you can say, oh, that's Mr. Richardson, the academic doctor. He's dyslexic, and he's autistic, because within that short time frame, I have renewed your mind by placing information that you didn't have in it before the 2 o'clock hour. So every time you're learning something from Mr. Moore's class or any other class, your brain is changing. Your brain is thirsting for new information. And the way you build a very strong and powerful brain 
is through the word practice. Do anyone have any questions so far? I see have, we have Miss Riley in the house. Hey, Miss Riley. And then we have what we said, KJ, Riley, and Williams. And so I'm gonna make sure that you guys are the first three to log in. And so I'm gonna make sure that Mr. Morris get a copy of my book. And I will be so benevolent that you guys will have my book and it deals with um, making college work for you. It has all my little quirky secrets. Um, I've done over, I think about 5,000 units so far and I'm just getting started. So I'll make sure that I autograph and give each of you a copy of my book. The reality guys is that I wouldn't be in this spot that I'm in right now if I didn't take the time out to practice and if I didn't learn how to value my time respectively. So now that you understand how to make flashcards correctly, the word, the definition, and the parts of speech, I'm going to give you an assignment. What I want you to do for me right now, I want you to write down on a piece of paper, paper what are the eight parts of speech. As you're writing down the eight parts of speech, I'm going to tell you a story. 99% of Black people in America do not know the basic eight parts of speech. But I will tell you this, 79% of my individuals who go through my coursework, once they master the eight parts of speech, I can guarantee you excellence when it comes down to any standardized test, whether it's GK, GRE, LSAT, ACT, it doesn't matter. What has not been taught to us as minority Americans is that the only way a teacher can develop and create a test is if they know the proper way of setting up the question. In other words, they spend more time finding three wrong answers and placing one answer in than they do having you to find the right answer. Let me restate that. It takes a lot of energy for me to put three incorrect answers on a piece of paper than it does to put the right answer. So if you're able to understand the eight parts of speech, you can quickly recognize what should not be there. And then you do what we call a process of elimination until you choose the best answer. And oftentimes it's because you don't know the parts of speech. So if we're dealing with these verbs, and I want you to go ahead and finish it, and these other items, once you understand the eight parts of speech, you can pick up immediately, especially on the GK, the English and the reading part, because the grammatical error in the choices will be so obvious that you can slash them out. But the problem is, we don't know the eight parts of speech. Um, anybody want to take a jab at it? KJ, you want to try it out? Do you, what, how many um, questions do you have so far, sir? Mr. Williams. I got four of um, them. Yeah, four. Mr. Williams, how many words do you have, sir? I have six. You have six. Miss Riley. Miss Riley, can you hear me? Wait, actually, I have. Is that Mr. Williams? You have how many, sir? Seven. I miscounted. You have seven? Miss Riley, are you here? Yes, Actually, I'll, just, I'll assume Ms. Riley can't hear me. I don't, I don't think she logged in and walked away. We won't think that. But here we go, guys. I don't want you to say them out loud because I want you to know them. And I don't ever want to make you feel intimidated or to embarrass you in front of your peers. So I'm going to list them out for you, but I need for you to write them down. And then this is one of my first assignments for you to do is to master the eight parts of speech. You will be a better writer. You become a better reader. You will perfect English much better and even the eight parts of speech crossover in mathematics. And so whenever we start to develop word problems and to answer them, I will teach you even how to beat them at the word problems just by knowing what's being stated. Number one is the word now. This is a person, place, theme, or idea, okay? All we did to the word now was we placed the word pro in front of it and now that becomes a pronoun. From there, the action that it took to put pro in front of noun, that word happens to be a verb. 
if we want to talk about how the verb was being performed, all we had to do, guys, was add to our verb. So now we have adverb. So that's the first four. The fifth one gets into describing what is taking place or what you're being asked to do in the word problem or the prompt or the reading. And that's gonna be your adjective. It is very descriptive. When we're bringing everything together or we call it collective, collectiveness, you have a word called a conjunction. Oftentimes when learning, we utilize conjunction in a theoretic way by saying we call them fanboys. And these are the obvious words that connect what a conjunction is. And this is simply an acronym. The F in fanboys represents the word for. The A in fanboys represents the word and. The N represents the word nor. The B is but, the O is or, the Y is yet, and the S is so. When you run into these connectivities, when taking a standardized test, you will know when to put a apostrophe. You will also know as a signal for a comma, a semicolon, or a colon. And we'll get into that in the next session. But by knowing the parts of speech, you have an extraordinary chance of choosing an, um, the right answer. Number seven is interjection. And the last one is what I'm doing right now. I am prepping you guys for the position of greatness. And that word is preposition. When I talk to friends and colleagues, everyone is always doubting my beloved students, by saying you guys are poor writers. I promise you, when you master the eight parts of speech, know how to utilize them correctly, when you start to look at words, you immediately will know if that's a noun, is that a person, place, thing, idea, but you will also know the types of nouns. You will know if it's a concrete noun, is it a proper noun, if it's a common noun, if it's, if it's an abstract noun. Why is that important? Because if we're dealing with proper nouns, that was give a name to something. My name is Mr. Richardson. So it's being properly placed. If I'm reading something that can be very, very difficult, the issue becomes that I can put any one of your name inside of the message and it doesn't change the message because it's only a proper noun. It's a name. So if I'm reading something for comprehension and the word just, I can't get the name right, I don't want to lose what I've comprehended, so I'll put someone name in, in that spot who I truly care about, or I'll put my own name in there, and I don't lose what I was able to comprehend. So by understanding the proper noun, it gives you an advantage to switch it up every now and then, and makes it very relevant to what you know and what you don't know. Because if we're talking about Russia, and I've visited Russia before, but if you never have been in Russia, it's kind of hard to imagine what it looked like. But if you put Tallahassee in the place of Russia, you know what Tallahassee looked like and you don't lose the content of what you just read. Does that make sense, guys? Mr. William, does it make sense to you, sir? Yes, sir. Okay, Mr. KJ? Uh, yes, sir. All right, do anyone have any questions up to this point? Any questions? All right, let's keep this party going. So one of the most significant things I will teach anyone to start off with getting ready for any exam is to know the eight parts of speech. In the interim, before I see you guys again, I want you to also look up why do we need to have a semicolon? Because they will throw that on the test to throw you off. Semicolon, some people say semi. You have this punctuation mark here, which is a colon. That's very popular on any test. Um, you also will have what my students call the comma in the sky, which is apostrophes. I want you to know when to use an apostrophe. 
And then most definitely, I want you guys to know how to utilize, and ladies, I oh should stop saying guys. I want everyone to understand the importance of utilizing a comma. These four things will be, be tested the most on most standardized testing, especially with the GK. You have to know when to use a semicolon, a colon, an apostrophe, and the um, infamous comma. Whenever doing the English subsection, I'm gonna teach you guys the next session on how to recognize it inside the sequence and to mark out certain words that you don't need to read while you're reading because they're used to trick you. So these are the things I want you to do. So first of all, you have the eight parts of speech so far. You're gonna make flashcards correctly and you're gonna know these four punctuation rules. Now let's talk about time. Because all I hear a lot is I didn't have time to get your work done, Mr. Zach. I was too busy. I hear all these different excuses and sometimes the excuse is very legitimate. So I'm not gonna call anybody out, but legitimate excuses is still an excuse at the end of the day. What most people don't know is that our time effectiveness or time prosperity, there are five things that you must do every day that no one takes into consideration, eats up a lot of time. Five things that we must do every day. Okay, five things we must do every day that we don't consider takes up time. Every day. We must do daily. Okay. All right. So can someone help me out? Mr. KJ, give me one thing that we must do every day. Uh, brush your teeth. Okay, so we're gonna call that hygiene. So I'm gonna put H Y G. Right. Hygiene. Okay. Um, do you have another one off the top of your head, Mr. Williams? Give me one. Sleep. You must sleep. Okay. Eat. That's oh look at Miss Riley on show. Hey, Miss Riley. Hello. All right, Miss Riley said she said eat. Okay. Mr. Morris, can you help me out? Can you give me one? I would say study. Okay, so we're gonna put study, we're gonna kind of put in there, we're gonna put work in there. So to study, it means to work, or we could put the word school because that's part of the study habit, okay? And then the last one is very obvious, but most people don't realize that a lot of time goes into doing this. And so they don't calculate this into their daily schedule. Right. And that is number one and number two. That is going to the restroom to urinate or to defecate. Now watch this guys. We notice that we have 24 hours in a day. The question becomes, do we really have 24 hours? We do scientifically, but we spend every day, we spend at least one hour with hygiene, brushing our teeth, getting dressed, ironing clothes for the young ladies who wear makeup, the makeup and the hair. So that's about one hour. So put down one hour for that. We are to get at least eight hours, but for college students, a lot of times you guys might get six hours in. So we'll, I'll be nice. I'll put six hours for sleep. We spend about two hours socializing and eating daily. So we have two hours for this. On a normal nine to five, we have about eight hours. And then when it comes down to washing your hands, going to the restroom, handling your business, we spend about an hour a day doing those things. So before we even get anything done, on a standard day, we have six plus one is seven, seven plus two is nine, nine plus eight is 17 plus one. We have 18 hours already allocated to things that we must do. So if we're dealing with 24 hours, it tells us that if we have 18 already been, been spent on the things that we must do, how much time do we have remaining for ourselves? And so for the most part, if we take 18, subtract with 24, we get six hours left. In my research project, what I noticed is that for many people, I'm gonna go ahead and clear this out, What end up happening with those six hours? We actually spend four hours on what they call 
Super Ease. And this is based upon a research project I did interviewing students and parents. And the four hours is the Super Ease are things that takes energy. Okay. First thing we look at is electronic devices, whether that's your cell phone, gaming, whatever it is, or your electronics, you are spending anywhere between three to four hours, whether that be electronics, your music, your computers, you know, online, social media, um, video games. And then we spend the time that E factor also, it takes energy for your relationships. So we already lose four hours for that. So we take away another four hours and then we left with two hours of uninterrupted time that we don't know nothing about. So now we have two hours left. And this is where I come in at. If you want to be extremely successful in life, you got to have a vision for these two hours. We know that there is 60 minutes. There is 60 minutes in one hour. Okay, we need to break it down in what we call what I devise as a quarter system project. So anything that you want to learn, you divide them up into quarter systems because the average human's um, attention span is about 15 minutes. So what I want you to do for me, or better yet for yourself, if you're prepared for the test, let's say that every day, if you spent 15 minutes going over your English, the math, the reading, and your essay every day, I promise you, at the end of the week, you have put seven hours total in your practice session because you got Monday through Sunday. These little 15 minutes would be very impactful. It's in the same token if you're taking 12 credit hours, and let's say that you have a math, um, a reading course, one of your electives, and then something dealing with your major. If you would just review your notes daily from each one of your class for 15 minutes, I guarantee you, you'll become a genius. Because by spending half of your day focusing on the GK and then the other half of your studies, you would have actually put in 14 hours of practice a week. But you know what happens? We don't even realize where the time is going. What I want you to do is to focus on the two hours. See, I gave you a chance to hang out with your girlfriends, boyfriends, do whatever you want to do with those four hours of super ease. I gave you another, what, 18 hours to just do what you have to do every day. And you still have two hours remaining. My theory of my ideology behind getting kids to be great or students to be great is to develop the two hours that you have remaining that you can't make an excuse for. Because you got your sleep, you already ate, you don't been to work, you've been to school, you hung out with your friends, you played the video games. Because I'm not trying to break habits. Nah, it's too hard to break. I'm trying to create habits, which is easy to do. If you can create a habit of spending eight 15-minute sessions, eight 15-minute sessions a day, that's it. I promise you, you will become a genius. I can teach you how to cheat time. I know you said, man, this man crazy. No, I'm being for real. When you're sitting down eating, and let's say that you're having, let's put down breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You can squeeze one of those sessions, those 15 minutes in during breakfast. You can squeeze one in during lunch. Now you got six. You can squeeze one in during dinner time. Now you got five left over. And then when you're in those classes, not saying that, fam, you have those problems, but you can go to some professors and y'all ain't doing nothing. You can squeeze a couple of 15 minute sessions in then. When you're at a stop um, traffic light, or better yet, when you're in the restroom, you have your business, get your little flashcard, get your little 15 minutes in as well. When you're on the phone with somebody who's very boring, all you have to do is say, yeah, right, uh-huh, and get you 15 minutes in going over your cards because you ain't paying no attention. Just keep it real. There's no excuse for us not being able to get these little eight 15-minute sessions in every day. I didn't say sit up there for two hours to study. I said take like grapes. 
if I took a bunch of grapes from Publix, a fresh market, which is all that fresh, and I started to devour all these grapes at the same time, before long, I'm going to have wine all over my shirt or grape juice. But if I want to get through my whole entire lesson, I treat it like a bunch of grapes. I'll just eat one grape at a time, and before long, the grapevine is empty. So I don't want you to have to feel stressed in college. I don't want you to sit around there saying there's just too much to do. But what I want you to do is to start activating an opportunity to perform these eight 15-minute sessions. And I don't want you to start out the gate doing it. You can start off with doing four 15-minute sessions. That's still one hour. An hour is an hour. But if you don't do nothing, you get nothing back in return. Do you understand that, young folks? Now, check this out. I've always wanted to do this. I'm a physics guy. I love physics, right? I'm going to teach y'all a physics equation. Okay, watch this. The most amazing physics equation that I've learned in my 50 years of being on Earth, five decades, watch this, guys, is the one that you're going to write down right now that's going to make you very powerful young people. And I say young because y'all younger than I. So the P equals W over T. So write this down. P equals W over T. Okay, what are you trying to say, man? Okay, here we go. The P represents the word power. Power is simply work, W-O-R-K, over time. This is a true physics equation. I had never seen it this way. And I started thinking about it, like, wow, this makes a lot of sense. If I'm going to become a very powerful individual, a very powerful test taker, or a very powerful lecturer, I need to take the time, or better yet, take work and put it in over time. But if you want to be a little sarcastic, you got to work over time. Or better yet, work over time in order for me to activate my power. It's amazing when we have all these storms across the state of Florida and everybody says, I don't have no power. And I'm like, no, you have power. You just don't have no electricity. See, power is built around your practice. If you're going to be powerful, you got to practice doing what you're doing very well. That's the bottom line. When I charge my parents over in Singapore for an assessment as an educator, because people want to make you guys believe there's no money in this field. They are lying. There's a lot of money in this field. When I do an assessment, I charge $500 for a 45-minute assessment. When I'm tutoring, I charge between $75 and $150 per hour. You can't tell me that's not no money, guys. And I build my own schedule. But in order for me to be able to do this, I had to activate my power which means that I had to put the work in over time, but I was only able to do that with the first word I taught you guys, and the word was practice. It's just that simple. We have to decide as a group, because we belong to the same body, as a group, that we want better for ourselves. The only way you get better at anything in life is through practice. I promise you, I would never lie to you about this. Like I promised you to tell you my backstory. So here's my backstory. My father was a pharmaceutical sale rep. The only problem was he didn't have a license. And you know what happened? Day came and got my dad. Day. That's the way I used to pronounce my word, day. You know how we try to say they? But truthfully, I was saying day the right way. It's the DEA, Drug Enforcement Officers or this drug enforcement agency picked my father up and then me and my siblings was living in this big old mansion with a bunch of kids and looked like us, you know? And it was very difficult to live up under the house where you got bunk beds and everybody fighting over clothes. And then one day, this beautiful young lady adopted me and she got me counseling. So if you're having to deal with some stuff that you bought onto the campus and you need counseling, get some counseling because the problems that you have manifested they don't go away unless you get help. So I was able to get a counselor. And then I had a therapist to help me with my articulation 
because I had a very difficult time and still do to a degree with my speech because of the dyslexia. I see words backwards. And so I try to enunciate them the way I see them. But my brain now has been activated to flip them the right way, but that came through practice. So the beauty of me having to struggle from day one, competing with 13 million microscopic sperm cells, you know what happened? Your boy won. Had I not won, you guys wouldn't hear my voice. So that makes me a winner. But watch this. Had you not won, you wouldn't be here either. So from day one, we are winners because we're competing in our mother's fallopia tube. And we're racing this amazing race, and we won. So that makes us winners, guys. Do not throw away your good DNA by blaming other people or not taking the time out to practice and become a better human being. Because we have a crisis going on right now. And that crisis is we don't have enough profound educators. I want each of you to be very efficacious, as we would say, which means to be effective. I live for the day to see each one of you passing the test and you're going on to create your own schools or create your own brand or create your own company because it's nothing like working for yourself, I'm telling you. But right now, y'all have the opportunity to be the best in the industry. But you got to practice. You have to activate your power. You must know those eight parts of speech in order for you to be the most incredible test taker on this planet okay all right the floor is open you guys can ask me any question about what we just talked about or you have any curiosity any thoughts running through your head it's your time now to feel freely to ask any question and i challenge you to ask and give me a hard one give me one that's made me laugh and say oh no that's none of your business but anyway just go ahead any questions Antonio, I see you over there. I see you. Any questions, sir? Uh, so what made you decide to uh, basically be like an educator like you are now? The beauty was being teased as a kid with autism. I would get into fights and confrontations because no one understood what was taking place. And I'll share this story with you. I was, uh, I recall the day where my teacher had asked me to read in third grade. Never forget this. And what I did was we used to have slate boards. I mean, I'm old. So we didn't have the dry erasing computers. So what I did was on this little board, it was like a little um, chalkboard. We used to write on it without chalk. So I said, this is what I wrote on my board. I put W-O-N. This is what I wrote. I put W. O N T O N. So Mrs. Chow, my third grade teacher, thought I was being funny. She said, Oh, Mr. Funny Man, one time. Okay, go to the office. So back then we had corporate punishment. They'll they'll beat us. Corporal punishment. And then I went back to class and I was upset. She said, read again. And I took my board, I did like this, said one time, go back to the office. I got paddled again. The next time I went back to her classroom and she asked me to read, I did it again and she sent me out and then I flipped the table. I was just a bad kid. What happened next was the counselor said, what is wrong with you, boy? And she said, what happened? I said, well, she asked me to read and I didn't want to read, so I did this. And she said, well, why would you be so mean to Mrs. Child Zachary? I don't understand that. Why would you say wonton? Now, a third grade, I don't know what a wonton is. We ate leftovers. We didn't eat out. We was poor. We didn't have that kind of life. So what is a wonton? So when the counselor came in, she said, she called my mom. My mom came out to the school. You know what happened, right? I got beat. And then the deal was, the lady said, oh, oh, my God, what were you trying to say? I was trying to say, not now. So the word ton is the word not and the word one is the word now. And that was the beginning to them testing me for a learning challenge, which was later discovered as dyslexia. So I spent most of my time in timeout getting beat because they didn't know how to diagnose me. And once the diagnosis had come through, I became a different kind of person. 
So as an educator, you have to have some kind of empathy for those kids that you're serving. It's not what's wrong with you, boy, that we should be asking. We should be saying, what happened to you? What happened to you? That shows a different sign that you care about your student. Oprah just came out with a book entitled, What Happened to You? And she talks about this new science that you guys are gonna have to be aware of, which is called ACE, Adverse Childhood Experiences. Those are the things that these young kids that you're gonna to have to teach one day has gone through that caused their brain not to be able to retain information the right way. Many of you have been faced with ACEs, single parent household, mom or dad incarcerated, dad being no mom, not having enough food, light issues, no light, no water. Those are natural things under the ACE study that will impair the way the brain functions. That part of the brain called the amygdala, fight or flight, can be shaped and warped based upon childhood experiences, good or bad. And so that's the reason why I became a part of education, because I wanted to make a difference. And I wanted to help those who have similar conditions like poverty and learning challenges to believe that no matter what, with a bit of practice and the activation of my power, you can accomplish anything in this world. And that's my answer for your story, sir. KJ, any questions, sir? No, I don't got no questions, but I, I like your story and I respect you for that. You know what I'm saying? And my brother has autism too, like severe autism. So it's kind of like giving me a different perspective on, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. And KJ, I will say this to you, sir, is that my advantage point for me was that it was caught early. And then a young lady who adopted me was very astute and making sure that she showed patience for me for a very long time. And that's the reason why I'm able to articulate and do stuff. She spent thousands of dollars on giving me services from day one. And I'm wishing you the very best with your young brother. And if anything I can personally do to help your parents, help guide him or steer him, you just don't hesitate to let Mr. Morse know or get in contact with me personally. And then I'll do, what I, I'll do what I have to do, bro. I mean that from the depth of my soul. Okay? All right, man. Appreciate you. No problem. Miss Riley, you have any questions? No. Okay, cool. Well, Mr. Morris, like my word is my bond for these three young lives that I want to make an impact on. They will get a copy of my book. Um, so when I see you this week, I'll make sure I get you a copy to make sure they have a copy of it. Um, this is my yeah, world, guys. I want to end with, and we do this first off, Zach, thank you very much. Let's give, you know, Mr. Zach a round of applause with your emojis at the bottom. Um, if you did have a question, but you didn't want to uh, share it on uh, with your voice, you can put it in the chat. That's something else I want you to put in the chat, Mr. Richardson. Everybody knows in my class, the goal is to get a, put it in the chat. And you'll see what I'm talking about. Yes, because we're yes, working yes. on this particular goal, right? So, and to get that goal, which is, they already put it in, a 4.0, they have to practice. They have to put and use their power. They got to put the work and they have the time to do it. So the best time to start is right now. Right now. Sure. Uh, so I always end with this piece is final thoughts. They got a chance to hear from you. I want to hear from them. What were your final thoughts about today's presentation? We'll go down the line. Let's go with the ladies first. Mrs. Riley. I was going to say that it was really inspirational and motivational. Love it. Mrs. Thank you. Duncan. Mr. Princess, welcome to the class. What are your final thoughts? I know you got a little bit late, but what did you think? Um, I liked your story and um, the acronyms and the physics equation. Love it, love it. I think Ms. Duncan has also some issues with the internet because we just lost it. So Mr. Williams, final thoughts. I thought it was effective because I like the explanations and how they were broken down to almost the simplest form so that I can understand it. Love Thank it. you, Mr. Williams. Thank you, sir. Love it. You're welcome. KJ. 
basically the same thing uh, Mr. Williams just said, very informative. I like how he broke everything down to a T, basically. You know what I'm saying? Different aspects to what we can do on the GK and stuff. Love it. Love it. And now that's actually going to go to my final thoughts, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, my final thoughts for today's class was really just the same, is that you got some great information, but now you have to use it, right? You got your 240 tutoring. You know what I'm looking for. You know that's part of your final for today, for my class. So putting in that 15 minutes every day will add up over time. And it will prepare you for the test. As you already know, my P's, proper planning prevents poor performance. So what Mr. Zach was sharing today was essentially, let's start preparing now and let's prepare properly so that we can pass the test. He's giving you actually more tools to your tool belt so that you can be greater. Uh, that's how you started the lesson. So I want to know, I'm going to be looking to see how you've been using your time in the 240 Tutoring app. Again, all this is, is practice. All this is is practice so that you'll be prepared to perform because that time is coming. Uh, we may have another surprise for you. I will let you know Mr. Richardson has shared another little added bonus. As you know, you yeah. pass the test. Here we go, guys. The first student, uh, I don't do it this way. I'm going to go bold with it. Um, the first three students to pass the GK exam is going to get a $250 cash um, check from me. Straight up. I'm not even so, playing with you now. If you go out there and do this, knock it out, I'm giving you $250 cash, no questions asked. All I need to do is see that certificate say you passed the test. I'm going to reimburse you for that. You get $250 straight now up. Now you already know. Is it all sections? Sorry. Go ahead. Say it again. She said, is it all, all the sections? All sections, correct. Um, yes, ma'am. You have four sections. That's the essay. Um, you also have the English. You have the reading. And you have the math. Now, listen to me, guys. The test is very simplistic. I, I mean that from, this, from my depth of my soul. They have somewhat dummy down the test. So if you can get it knocked out between this semester and next semester, you will see that you can matriculate through it faster. And then the stuff that I just shared with you today in regards to the parts of speech, I'll be back to talk about the math. And I want you all to master these skill sets. Again, place this stuff on flashcards, put in a shoebox. All you have to do weekly is shake them all up and keep going back through them. Add to the box. Next week, shake them up, go back through them. Week three, the box is getting heavy. But spend the time to go through it, and you'll have that spiral effect. So the stuff that you're learning now early on, you're not losing sight of it because you're going to go through each one of those flashcards. You're going to master those skill sets. And then when you sit for the test, you're going to make the necessary points. I want you guys to pass this thing so bad that I'm giving away part of my honorarium back to the first three that accomplish this task because I need help out here in this field. I need y'all to be ready to help these kids who are dealing with the pandemic effect, these kids who are going through so much and not being properly taught. And so I can't do it by myself. I need you for y'all to come on my team and build your own companies so that we can work effectively to help the next generation be successful. So I told them, tell them this all the time. Our class knows this, the future is where? Now, right here, right here, right here, now, sorry. right here, right here. Now, that was the future, right here. So, uh, you have another bonus. You have Mr. Richardson, and you also have the School of Education. You know, if you pass the test the first time around, they will pay for your test. So, you have everything you need. All you need to do right now is practice. So that's pretty much all we have for today. Again, Mr. Richardson, thank you for, for coming. Thank you for sharing your wisdom, your knowledge. We're going to have part two to this uh, series. I will let you guys know when the second one takes place. That's on the uh, flyer um, so that you can participate with the rest of my students. Yes, thank October 18th and November 1st. Go ahead and mark the date, October 18th at 2.30 and November 1st at 2.30 as well. Please watch the, um, go back and watch the rerun online. Um, also, make sure you tell your classmates this is for them. We need for them to participate. Um, the show that they really taking this thing serious. 
And that's what it's all about.